Hey, everybody. Good afternoon, and welcome back to the 1455 author series. Uh, this is our at least once a month event where we uh, get together with a writer with a new book out, and we talk to them about it. Um, so it's always exciting, and uh, I don't play favorites, but some events are more exciting than others. It's always an absolute honor to be in the presence of greatness, and today that is being delivered via our own DC's local legend and national treasure, E. Ethelbert Miller. Um, for those of you checking us out for the first time, I'm Sean Murphy. I'm the executive director of 1455. And very uh, succinctly, we are a nonprofit that seeks to celebrate storytelling and storytellers. Uh, you can find out a lot more about us at 1455litarts.org. And I welcome you to reach out and let me know if you want to get involved. But today, the focus, as always, is on the author. But before we jump in, uh, I am always thrilled to partner with our pals at DC's historic Potter's House. And uh, here it is, Adams Morgan Day. What a double honor. Uh, Lee Tibble, who directs that amazing uh, institution, is here to say a few words. And Lee, as always, I see the spotlight and you're welcome to talk about the amazing work that you and your team do. Well, thank you, Sean and Ethelbert. It's so nice to be on with you. It's this is this is just like a, a reunion day. So I'm thrilled to be here with both of you. Um, yes, hi everybody. I'm Lee Tivell, the executive director of the Potter's House. We're thrilled that you're all here, uh, and it is in fact Adams Morgan Day. So we have been celebrating all day with books and coffee and community, uh, which is really what we're all about. Um, for those of you that we have not met before, the not, the Potter's House is truly a place that is about community. We are a nonprofit social enterprise. We're a cafe and a bookstore. And in non-COVID times, we're also an event space. Um, and we have been here offering radical hospitality in Adams Morgan since 1960. Um, we are part of the fabric of this community and we are here to serve our neighbors uh, in whatever ways that we can. Uh, one of those ways is through our Pay It Forward program, which is currently serving about 1,600 free hot meals every month to anybody in need. That number has just exploded during the pandemic. That's something we're, we're honored and humbled to offer. So if you or anybody else you need are in Adams Morgan and need a bite to eat, come on by and we'd be glad and honored to take care of you. Um, and uh, I, I also encourage you to sign up for our newsletter. If you don't know us, sign up, look, uh, check us out on social media. It's pottershousedc.org uh, for news and updates about other events um, and fun things that we're undertaking. I will say it is particularly meaningful for me to be here with Sean and with Ethelbert, um, who is, you know, if y'all don't already know Ethelbert, you will soon. He knows everybody in this town, I think. And um, again, part of the fabric of this city, I am really honored and proud to call Ethelbert a friend. He is a friend to many organizations and bookstores and literary folks in this town. And also, if I remember correctly, Ethelbert, you grew up in this neighborhood, right? I live, I live behind the Platters House. Street, right? Yeah. Fuller Street, right? Yeah. He 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 knows he knows us well. He knows this neighborhood well. Um, we carry a whole range of Ethelbert's work in our shop. Um, you can also buy your copy of When Your Wife Has Tommy John Surgery right now from our bookshop.org storefront and i will drop that link into the event comments momentarily but i encourage you to drop by and peruse many of his works that we have on the shelf here so um with that i will just say thank you again for joining us today everyone and thanks to the two of you for letting me pop in for a minute during adams morgan day and i will let you two take it from here thanks lee Thank you so much, Lee. Again, always a pleasure. And we'll make sure we put links to um, Potter's House and some information for people to find out more and support independent bookstores by uh, being patrons and, and customers of your amazing establishment. So thank you so much. Yeah, y'all are the best. Adam Morgan Day. <laughs> Thanks. All right. For, forgive me in advance for what I'm about to say, but let's play ball. Uh, <laughs> Let me, as always, like I said earlier, uh, it really is, it's a genuine honor to share space. I've had the privilege of being on stages, both virtual and, and physical with this gentleman. Uh, I will introduce formally in a second, but I just want to say that, um, you know, 
I, I know I'm speaking for countless people when I include Ethelbert as a personal hero, not just on an artistic level, but a, as a human being and the ideal literary citizen. And we talk about that at 1455 a lot. What does it mean to build community? What does it mean to be a part of a community? Ethelbert's life work embodies community. He's connecting people. He's generous with his time. He's always looking to help others. Uh, and that spirit of generosity comes across in his work. So while I'm always happy to share space and talk to him, it's a real honor to talk about the work because I think because he's such a superhero, we lose sight of the fact that he's also a brilliant poet. So for me, uh, it's, a, it's a genuine joy to be able to talk about our national pastime in this new collection, When Your Wife Has Tommy John Surgery. Um, I, I will read the condensed version because we'd be here all day if I read uh, this, this man's accolades and encomiums, but I will put the full uh, bio when we do our write up on this. But E. Ethelbert Miller is a writer and literary activist. He's the author of two memoirs and several books of poetry. He has served as the editor of Poet Lore and hosts the weekly WPFW morning radio show On the Margin with E. Ethelbert Miller. He's also a producer of the Scholars series on UDC TV. And if God invented baseball, the first book in a trilogy about baseball and poetry was awarded the 2019 Literary Award for Poetry by the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. Again, the truncated version, but you get the point. Ethelbert, welcome, sir. Oh, so it's good to see you, Sean. Thank you for, for not reading my obituary. <laughs> <laughs> that will be many, many uh, seasons away, let's hope. You, you've you referred to the seventh inning. I hope that this is like the fifth inning. We got a lot of, we have a lot of work and fun still to, mm -hmm. to, to get into, but uh, we are here today primarily to celebrate. So congratulations on the, on the release of your book. And normally this is the time where I hold up a copy. This is so hot off the presses and I'm traveling this week. I don't have my physical copy yet. It's probably at home waiting, but I sh sure as heck have my Kindle version. So there's some kind of weird symmetry about we're going to talk about baseball in old school and analog. And I read this collection uh, <laughs> digitally, but that, that's what we're all about, right? We got it. The show must go on one way or the other. Um, so this is a continuation of your very obvious love affair with baseball. So I think it makes all the sense in the world to um, have you talk a little bit about this game that you, you clearly, anyone that knows you as a person, but certainly anyone that reads this work understands that you, you really do have a lifelong passion for and deep knowledge of this game. So what is it about baseball that just compels you? Well, you know, I, I, I like to say that even though I represent baseball in my family, I guess my family is more like maybe basketball and track because of my children. Um, and I say that with a, a considerable amount of pride, you know, especially my son and daughter and what they've done in sports and continue to do in sports. Um, what I've done is um, what many writers do, especially when they're writing their memoirs. You go back to their childhood. You go back to when you're growing up. You're going back to the things that you enjoy. Uh, and baseball was one of them. You know, it's impossible for me to think of growing up in New York and not think about the New York Yankees. You know, uh, it's impossible not to talk about growing up in the South Bronx and playing catch with friends of mine in you know, elementary school or the St. Mary's Projects. So to write about that uh, experience is to write about something that I love and actually also write about my roots. And, and you do. And, and, and one of the, you know, to, to me, Edward, there's so many things I wrote down. So first of all, I do want to I genuinely thank you for writing this work. Um, I am a I am a baseball fanatic. I, I know we root for different teams, but, um, you know, I, I'd like to think that I, you know, I bring more than a casual uh, appreciation for the game. But of course, I'm a little bit younger than you, but a couple of years. And so there's a real, you know, hearkening back to an era when there were both more and less teams, more in New York uh, before everything changed. It, 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 it's a real treat. And I think anyone, uh, this is such a great gateway for anyone that's trying to understand poetry and the topic is so accessible. Uh, but what I think you, one of the things you achieve in this collection, which, I mean, I know you, I know your work, so I wasn't surprised by it, but yes, ostensibly this is about baseball. It's baseball poems, but of course, you're talking about your life. You're talking about America's history and you're intertwining right. them. 
I think the first question I really wanted to ask you is, in your opinion, why is baseball such a fertile subject for these types of explorations? Well, you know, you can look at, um, you know, this is September 12th, but you can look at what happened after September 11th in terms of, you know, baseball, you know, the Yankees, you know, uh, where people felt that, you know, here was an opportunity for the city to come together. Um, and, you know, this is why we call it the American pastimes. And uh, it is something that people um, uh, grow up with. They enjoy, you know, you think of, you know, fathers and sons playing catch. You think of young women, you know, today now making a presence in, in, in baseball. Um, and that's very important in terms of, you know, when I grew up, you know, um, you were listening to the radio. And so baseball came to you through the voices of various uh, sports announcers. Um, and that listening, um, is also sort of um, helps your imagination because you're not actually seeing the images. You, you're, you're imagining the ball going over the fence. Uh, and so in that sense, um, baseball is that, that dream, that, um, that sense of, um, of something special about it. You know? um, and it's something that we've seen depicted in film. It's something that we've seen the, um, um, very much our change society. You know, uh, whether it's the steroids error, whether it's um, trying to speed up the game, uh, all these things, I think, reflect our society. You know, we look at baseball today and we, we ponder the absence of African-American players, you know, um, where are the new Hank Aarons and Billy Mays, you know, um, but at the same time, we see the growing presence of, you know, Latino players and Japanese players, you know, uh, and so in this sense, when you look at a baseball game, it represents uh, our uh, American diversity, you know, on the field. Yeah, and you know, I think there's something about baseball that, unlike the other sports, has always kind of drawn the the, the writers. Uh, whether it's the sports writers, I think of John Updike, uh, it leaps immediately to mind among you know so many others. But there, there's something that's very self. Baseball is aware of itself. The people that enjoy it, um, the people that play it when you read about baseball, even in the early days, which, you know, we hearken back to as the good old days, um, there was a sense of, there was always competition, whether it was football or basketball mm -hmm. or, or any number of other, you know, TV. Um, sure, but, there, but there's key people, John. you know, when I was working on, um, if God invented baseball, I was looking at what to put on the, the cover of the book. And what happens is that um, there are a number of people, you know, when you think of inventions, you think of like maybe Thomas Edison. Well, Thomas Edison was a big baseball fan. I think one of the, you know, I mean, that, I mean, it's him, but there's pictures of him and Connie Mack. You know, then all of a sudden I, I, I realized that um, Duke Ellington was a baseball fan. Frederick Douglass' son played baseball. You know, you, when you begin to look at this amazing history of the sport, you know, for me, you know, what I, as a writer, what I was tapping into, you know, was, you know, African-American culture. You know, I was always interested in terms of, um, you know, the story behind the Jackie Robinsons, you know, uh, the Larry Dobies who get overshadowed by Jackie Robinson or the Roy Campanellas. Uh, and then, you know, what we've seen finally is more attention being given to the um, uh, Negro Baseball Leagues. Okay? Yes. And, and, you know, I'm happy that, you know, Satchel Page is on the cover of my first baseball book. Yeah. Well, before we move on from young or very young, you're still a young man to me, but you're <laughs> Thank very you, young, Do you credit? <laughs> Do you credit those early memories of, cause you know, I, I don't want to get carried away with the whole storytelling. I mean, I always want to get carried away, but mm -hmm. I don't want to, I don't want to go too, you know, melodramatic on how these sportscasters in a, in a radio era were, were obliged to tell the story of the game, but how much maybe did that jumpstart your young imagination? And do you credit baseball and listening to those games? for? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. You know, I mean, my, my, my life was changed by the 1960 World Series, which I heard on the radio. You know, I can still, you know, remember Bill Mazeroski <laughs> hitting the ball over, over the field. You know, so what happens is that that's how it came to me. But the other sport that came to me, um, you know, through um, radio was um, boxing. Mm. You, know, you know, those early Cassius Clay before, we, before it was Muhammad Ali. And, and um, it's fascinating to, to listen to radio about those boxing matches and then actually see the actual footage. You know, where somebody says, yeah, Sonny Liston swings and, and Cash Slay's on the other side of the ring. Yeah, when you see it, <laughs> you know, he is on the other side of the ring. Um, but, you know, you, you're hearing sports um, through radio and, and it connects with your imagination. Uh, and it's part of the joy of growing up. Right. 
Right. And, 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 and not for nothing. Right. I, I think there's less of it today, but I certainly remember from my younger years, you see the so-called old timers that have their headphones on and are, they want to listen to the play by play, even when they're watching it live. Mm. There's something very profound about that. I think yeah. that's not a well, you know, right. And and you know, you go to the ballpark, you see the older people still, you know, keeping the scorecard, you know, I was going to ask you, do you still do that? No, I never, I, you know what? I never learned how to do that. You know, um, in terms of my, my early thing with baseball was, was pretty much collecting baseball cards. Uh, right. And that was something which I really wish I had never given away all my uh, baseball cards away. But, you know, um, I never um, got into the whole thing of recording, you know, through, through the, the score parts. Um, mm -hmm. And so what happens is that that sort of like, how can I say, knowing, you know, you appreciate the game, but you can't read music. You know, um, so I, I would look at it that way. And, and that's a key point because at one time when I was growing up, um, I played piano really well. I can play a note, you know. Uh, I got a feeling that if I had mastered the whole intricacy of the um, scorecard, I'm probably trying to figure out, okay, it's the 10th inning and where do I put this man on second base that's starting off the 10th inning? <laughs> I mean, all these things have changed, you know, um, that I, it would be a sort of like, you know, going back and trying to learn, you know, calculus or something like it, trigonometry, you know, trying to figure out these new equations right. that are now are changing the game and changing the notation. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, we, we touched on it a little bit. I'd like to, I'd like to take another step into the water. I, I, it kept occurring to me while I was reading this collection. Of course, I've read the, the first one too, if God had been at baseball. Um, baseball, like jazz, like blues, uh, like bourbon, uh, is a very uniquely American invention. And uh, I think we, we talk about it or have talked about it as this democratizing force, which it is, but it's a form that has been uh, achieved at its highest levels and in times perfected by black men. And, and I think it's a very important um, signpost that your, your, you know, your books here are, are very deliberately from the covers to the content trying to make sure that that's really understood. And, and I think it's in that regard, very of our time, very of a moment where a lot of people are maybe more, there's people that are less receptive <laughs> to what's going on, but the, the national conversation, I think is at least open to remembering or being educated about. Well, sure, that's, that's the national um, conversation, but you know, my, my work um, um, for many, many years, um, it always has been filled with a certain degree of darkness, you know. Um, I, you know, the whole issue of depression, whether it's with my family, you know, um, the fact that I've lost over the years many um, dear friends to suicide. Um, so when I sit down and write, sometimes the blues comes through my work that way. You know, for example, even the title poem, When Your Wife Has Tommy John Surgery, is basically about a woman. Uh, well, man and, and husband and wife um, in, in a relationship that's not working anymore, you yeah. know, uh, and, for, and I'll, I'll read that. So please um, do, because I, yeah, I, yeah. I just, and just so you know, that was, that's definitely one of my questions. Let's just jump right to that. That's a, and that's a great way to, to really get into this. Right. And, and there's two poems um, about Tommy John, uh, references to Tommy John. And, and so I'll read you the first one and then I'll read you the title poem, which is pretty much following the first one. Because right. in this poem, Tommy John knocks on the bedroom door. Uh, if you were not familiar with who Tommy John was, this poem um, documents that. And then I'm only going to read um, the first three sections, but the fourth section is just a list yeah. of all, it's like a list poem of all the baseball players who have had Tommy John surgery. I won't, you know, read that, but I'll just read the first three parts. Okay. One, once my arm around her was like circling the bases. She was the woman I came home to. Now my arm talks in its sleep, the pain throbbing here and there. My wife sleeps in another room. Two, they call him a bionic man. His arm repaired as if someone has taken him off, taken him to Mr. Thompson's auto repair on the corner. Three, he might never pitch again, his elbow gone, blown. What is only a Colorado ligament reconstruction? Where did they take the tendon from? Tommy John was an all-star in 1968. So many died that year. 
MLK and RFK. Tommy John was on the mound one day in 1974, the day the butcher came and cut him down. Grown men are known to cry when led from the field, their arms limp, a manager's hand on their shoulders. Dreams die when they reach that first step of the dugout. And that's how me John um, knocks on the bedroom door. And I make stuff up, but this factual stuff in the poem, you know, about Tommy John um, having this surgery. And if you go back, you know, or even you talk to people who are, you know, in the medical profession, and over the years they'll tell you this, the, the, the human arm is not really designed for pitching, <laughs> you know, over and over, you know, and that's why you hear every now and then uh, a fastball pitcher coming up and, and his arm gets blown. Or what happens is that you hear a lot of concern about young kids, especially in Little League, you know, wanting to throw curveballs because it's just that, that repetitive motion damages your arm. Now, Tommy John, 1974, was radical surgery, taking a tendon from the like, leg and moving up and, and repairing the arm, you know, you have that sort of surgical mark that's left as a, like a marking, a little tattoo that you have, which indicates that you had that surgery. And what's fascinating, and this is why it's named after Tommy John, Tommy John was good. And Tommy John was really good after Tommy John's surgery. And, and he was good after Tommy John's surgery. And that's why that surgery has his name attached to it. Um, and what I try to do is take that and look at the title poem, When Your Wife Has Tommy John's Surgery. Your wife says you need therapy. Her words keep hitting the corner of the plate. You step out of the box and talk to yourself. You already know the next pitch that's coming. It's the argument that leaves her hands with marriage deception. It's the hard, fast stuff, the slamming of the door, the turning of the back in bed. You can no longer recognize the rotation of love, the spin of desire, the funny movement of lust. Your wife has changed and now she's seeing someone else. You know, John, what I like about this poem is how the title interacts with the first line. When your wife is Tommy John surgery, the first line of the poem is your wife says you need therapy. So you have this contrast between therapy and, and, and um, surgery. The other thing about it is it gets into what we're able to measure now because of analytics. We're able to measure the rotation of the ball. And so what you see in the last stanza of this poem, you can no longer recognize the rotation of love. Okay, the rotation of love. So you could be in a relationship and think that you're in love, but you can't see the rotation <laughs> that's coming at you, you yeah. know? Uh, and, and this is where I make those connections between baseball and personal you know, relationships or issues dealing with race or um, things dealing with the environment. This is what I try to do in terms of using baseball as a metaphor. Yeah, and, 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 you know, I, I'm always wary of being asked and certainly asking any writer to talk about where the ideas come from, because sometimes they're elusive and, and we want to keep it that way. But was there a eureka moment for you when you realized that Tommy John surgery was such a, a profound uh, and, and just ripe metaphor to use, not just for this collection, but, you know, to assess a number of the topics you assess in this book? Well, more, more important, um, uh, Sean, is that I put a lot of emphasis on, on titles um, in terms of, you know, God Invented Baseball, you know, or for example, um, the next book that comes out, that's the final book of the trilogy, How I Fell in Love Behind the Catcher Mask. Um, so, you know, I had many poems in, in my manuscript, but, you know, um, I felt that how your, you know, when your wife has Tommy John surgery was very interesting, you know, because even doing, you know, research, I didn't, I didn't immediately think of a woman having Tommy John surgery. You say, you know, I always think of men having Tommy John surgery, but I, I, I and I was just curious whether there might've been a, like a, a woman um, tennis player or something, but, you know, keep in mind, you have to be throwing a ball many times to have that sort of injury, you know, to, to your arm. Um, so, and, and then also what was very interesting was how I was going to, um, what was I going to put on the cover? You know, for example, uh, I know what I'm going on the cover of the last book, which would probably be a, a, 
a photograph of Josh Gibson, the famous catcher of the Negro League. So I like the fact that if you put the three books together, his satchel page and his Josh Gibson. But the whole thing of, of, of trying to depict the, 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 a photograph, you know, for um, when your wife had Tommy John surgery, I immediately thought I was thinking about um, the medical profession. And we looked at some images of Black hospitals um, in black nurses and 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 uh, I didn't want anything that was really too depressing. <laughs> so I came across with these nurses, which is one of the first black hospitals in, in Chicago. And, and I sent this, <laughs> it's like a joke. I sent this book, uh, the photo of the cover <laughs> to a relative in Brooklyn. And she says, oh, immediately, don't you see your sister? My sister was a nurse, right? <laughs> so she said, no, you can see in that back row there, and looks like your sister, <laughs> you know? And I said, okay, give me a break. When my first book came out, people thought I was Satchel Page on the covers. <laughs> so you can see, John, we need to, and, yeah, and you're having a festival workshop, we need to workshop book covers, <laughs> you know, before we get to the manuscripts instead. Well, and you know, that, that that's, a, that's a fascinating side topic too, right? Like who is the cover for? Clearly it's right. on one level for the, for the readers. Sure. But I think ultimately the, the author has to have a say in that. And, and it has to satisfy, just like the, the poetry itself has to first and foremost satisfy the person writing it, I think. Sure, yeah. But you don't have the luxury, right? Which is what we learn in, the, in, the, in our earliest workshops. You don't have the luxury as the writer to be able to explain either the poem or the cover or whatever. Right. So it becomes well, this interesting you know, symbiosis in terms of- Well, well you know, when you say that, you know, I'm wearing a, a June Jordan shirt, by the way, but what happened, I remember when June's book, um, Things I Do in the Dark came out, you know, <laughs> Tony Morrison was her editor. <laughs> and what happened, if you get a copy of the, the, the first copy of the Things I Do in the Dark, it's like a, you know, naked body, you know, it's a new body and there's a hand, you know, coming across like that. And, you know, it's very sensual. But what yeah. June was, you know, who was a political writer, things I do in the dark was June would talk about when she woke up, you know, she would grope. You know, you're looking for your glasses and things, things I do in the dark, you know, searching, you know, so you can look at the political interpretation of that, that sort of, you know, trying to find answers and stuff. And nothing nothing to do with the sensuality. I mean, June's work was it's very sensual, but that was not the cover design. <laughs> that, I remember when those box of books came, we opened Brooklyn, box arrived, and we like, looked at it, and yeah, I let that go. But, you know, um, that's what sometimes these large companies do. They, they, they have some sort of person on the second floor designing covers, and this is their take. And they'll tell you, this will sell better. You know, I remember, I, I, tested, I tested my cover my my family, it's my son said, oh, I don't like that daddy, you know? So, and then I said, well, this is how the government works. I'll just veto that. Oh. <laughs> he hasn't yeah, gotten well, a book yet. <laughs> that, that, that's a player who's been to a few all-star games taking the- No, that's the a game. basketball player. Look at <laughs> talking to his daddy who's a baseball player. No, I'm saying you, you, you've, uh, you've been to a few all-star games in your yeah. career. So you can, you can invoke that authority, right, right. the authorial privilege. Right. Well, but it is, it, but it is a, a nice thing in terms of having that sort of feedback, you know, from family and friends. Sure, sure. Um, so uh, speaking of the central metaphor, but also kind of really turning it on its head by, I think the assumption would be that the metaphor would be talking about the man with Tommy John surgery, mm -hmm. whether it's the athlete or the husband or whomever. Um, how, how much... Ethelbert, did you, I, I, I feel like somebody that doesn't know you at all or, or you know, is not a, a deep reader of poetry would appreciate and find much to savor in this collection just on a baseball level. And, and so I'm really, I, I love the artistry of how you, you on one, you know, there's, there's, you contain multitudes. There's, some of these poems are very, on a first read, straightforward. It's about, a, it's about a particular player, about a particular situation. But of course, many of them, if not most of them, are, are operating on at least a couple of levels. Well, you know, I think when we deal with poetry, Sean, uh, every poem operates on different levels, you know, and one of the key levels is how the poem interacts with the reader. And so one of the beautiful things about, you know, poetry is that, you know, you can share it with several people. And when they come around, they'll have um, different, interpretations, uh, a different feeling to the poem. Uh, I always tell people that when one's reading a poem, it's always important to you know, find a, a window or door that you can open and, 
and that's how you experience the, the poem. You know, just for example, you know, another way of defining stanzas say it's, it's a room. And, and so what happens is that you go into the room and you look around and, and you know, maybe you're lost, but what happens is that you work your way through the next stanzas. And so what happens is that, you know, when I look at how people who have no interest in, in, in uh, baseball respond to the poems, and I'll give you examples of, of two poems that I think work, whether you um, like baseball or not. And I'll read you these two. And the reason why I think they, they work is because um, they use humor, okay? And if I had to give some credit um, to a person who influenced me, it would probably be the poet Sterling Brown. You know, his some rare poems, which were very funny, you know, and he would also tap into African-American folklore. And so what happens is I try to have poems, you know, at least in the ones I've written over the years, that have a sense of humor. Uh, and, and this poem is called True Confessions of a Baseball. One, if they would replace my stitches with cornrows, I'm certain I could attract more black pitches. Two, when you come from a large family, people will toss you back and forth. Three, people keep falling over seats for me. Who needs a rain delay with so much seduction in the air? Four, I tell folks I have to always be handled with gloves. Five, every time I brush against a man's jersey, he tries to get to first base. And then I'll read you this other poem, which also I think captures a sense of humor. Um, but politics, the cardboard season of 2020, the summer of Black Lives Matter. We looked around the empty ballparks, staring at black cardboard faces, wondering who decided where to place us. <laughs> now, I'll, I'll go back with the, the first one, you know, True Confessions of Baseball, which, you know, if you look at a lot of my work going back to um, when I started, you know, my roots in terms of what got me started was the Black Arts Movement of the late 1960s. What, what happens is that when I began to mature as a writer, the strong influence on my work was from Black women writers, whether it was Entezaki Shange or, or Lucille Clifton and uh, June Jordan, Alice Walker. The, the, the women uh, affected my work. And when I gave talks, um, I would always talk about the 1970 being the femin feminization of African-American literature. And um, when I talk about that, I'm looking at how like the women's movement um, and like many movements, many movements really, if you wanna look at the success of them, look at who might've been in opposition to the movement, okay? So if you wanna look at the success of the civil rights movement, look at how white people have changed, okay? When you look at the success of the women's movement, especially in terms of literature, look at what it does to African-American authors, okay? August Wilson is not gonna put a play on the stage like a Richard Wright novel. Okay, or Ralph Ellison, you know, the women characters are going to be developed, you know, even like um, someone like Clarence Major having, a, you know, writing in a woman's voice. All those things are part of the fact that, you know, we have grown to appreciate the female voice. And so what happens now as black male authors, you just can't say, oh, I didn't know how you felt or this or that, or, or you accept responsibility that, okay, I have to make sure that I acknowledge the presence of women in a certain way in terms of heroic way, or the fact that they're, they're the main character and not just simply setting the tables. And so that's one of the things I, I try to do in my work. And, and in this case, the true convention of baseball, you know, you see me writing from the, the uh, a female perspective. But what's interesting in the first stanza, if they, if they would replace my stitches with cornrows, I'm certain I could attract more black pitches. Well, that deals with the politics of the fact that there are very few black pitches. I mean, Josiah Gray on the, on the Nationals now, one of the few black, oh, well, actually it's two black pitches on, on McGraw's. You know, you've got a, something unusual, you know, because, you know, you could watch a lot of baseball games before you see uh, a black pitcher. You know, I remember when Al Downing, you know, was, was pitching for the Yankees. You know, we might have had an Elson Howard catching, but you know, you didn't have any. You know, you had Whitey Ford on the mound. You know, before you had a black pitcher, and 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 so the joke here is that okay, if the if you turn the stitches to cornrows, you know, you know, brothers be like, yeah, let, let, me, let me see that ball, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. And but the other one is even more political. The cardboard scene in twenty twenty. You know how you look at the, when you had the cardboard, right? 
And, yeah. and I said, well, you know, you got more black people in the ballpark than normally. <laughs> you know, they got the good seats. <laughs> can you imagine, you know, you're in a place, you know, you can name some cities, like, you know, like Milwaukee, like, you know, how many, how many black people go to Milwaukee? I mean, or Fenway Park. <laughs> can you imagine you put like about maybe 10 cardboard faces, you know, during the, you know, behind the plate in Fenway Park. And now you know that's 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 more than affirmative action. <laughs> you know, get them seats. <laughs> and and what, what happened, you know, somebody yeah. makes a decision. That's right. You know, some right. you know the same way, you know, somebody would you would ship the cardboard faces. Yep. And then, and this is where you get into the country, you know, like, oh well we're not we're not gonna put those there. Or or, or what happened, you got a black male next to a white woman <laughs> in Atlanta. Right. right. <laughs> and somebody says, I don't like baseball. <laughs> well, I'm I'm glad that you you invoked that particular poem because I, I would call that a, a, a prototypical uh Ethelbert uh achievement in that it's deceptively simple. Right. Uh, it's it's deceptively short mm -hmm. and it's deceptively uncomplicated, but you're packing and you've, and you've just explained. But, there, but, there, but, there, but Sean, there's a tradition. I mean, you yeah. know, if, if you take me back to, you know, Cook Hall, Howard University, you know, I'm reading, you know, I'm reading like Langston Hughes. I'm reading Norman Jordan. You know, you know, all of my poems back then were very short poems, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and people say, oh, you must be writing. I wasn't writing haiku. You know, I was even speaking Japanese. What happens is that uh, I was I was trying to write, as, probably learning how to write. I do know that what affected my structure and the length of my poems was the fact that I began to do more public readings. Uh, mm -hmm. And just like the beginning of, 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 of this taping, of this recording, you know, <laughs> I said, don't be my, I was joking. But sometimes people give me a long introduction, <laughs> but my own, I got up and read a few <laughs> poems and sat down. So, you know, I tried to make sure that, well, I better have a little longer poems, you know. Uh, and, I, and I found out that, and this is what I tell people, and maybe this is why I also started the Ascension Poetry Reading Series, to give people that confidence to, 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 to write you know, and, be, and, and share their work with others and so have a reading. And so all I tried to do was try a platform for people, but I felt that that was something that would give people confidence in their work. It would also be a way of, of sharing your work and then going back and maybe dealing with revisions and stuff. So I saw that as, as a process. And I do know that poetry readings really affected me in terms of the, the length of my poems and the, the, how they were composed, but also in terms of subject matter. You know, I remember, for example, like the late 70s and the 80s, my work completely shift uh, once I left Howard University and was living in like neighborhoods, you know, like, you know, Adams Morgan and Mount Pleasant, um, where all of a sudden I was pulled in and writing about what was going on in El Salvador and Nicaragua, you know, in Chile. And what happened, <laughs> that's what I was writing about. And somebody invited me to some church, maybe in the Southeast or somewhere, <laughs> some Baptist church. <laughs> oh, we asked them to come read some poems. And, you know, I came in the church and, and, and I'm, I do my typical reading, right? And I'm looking at these older black women that live here, you know, and I looked at and I read the audience, like, you know, you, this is football now more than baseball. Right. You know what happens? You call an audible, and I realized I needed to find a poem that at least had Jesus in it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> because what happened? I was not communicating with you know my audience. I I had pretty much as a writer been guided by my politics and my political involvement. So I was doing things you know around Nicaragua. You know, reading poems to people who would meet in all, uh, all Souls Church. You know, but what happens is that that was where I realized, okay, the importance of communicating with one's audience. they having poems that you know would open up for discussion. You know, and that's where I began to also explore um, different topics. And then as a political writer, take poems that might be um, um, challenging to an audience. You know, I remember, for example, I would take some poems if I was giving a reading in they say Salt Lake City, and I took some poems in which, you know, I was dealing with, you know, the gay movement, for example, because I would tell people, I said, there have any gay people in the room, but you have to realize this is one of the most important movements that's shaping, you know, your life, you know, and, and, and you take and you use those poems you know, as bridges for people to, to, to get across. Or for example, how I read the humor, the poems that are humorous, because what I always insist when I gave reading is I always want to have a discussion after I read poems, okay? And I did that because I did not want to be coming a, 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 an entertainer. I didn't want to, after like reading X number of poems, somebody come up and say, oh, I, I, like, I like the music in your voice. I could, you know, I really like how you read. No, but what, what, did, what was I writing about? You know, how did you feel about some of the ideas? Um, and 
it was a way in terms of sometimes interacting with the audience. I remember, for example, going into a school and I was reading my Omar poems, which is by a little Muslim boy. And after a class session, you know, the boy was very happy because what happened, he was a Muslim and his name was Omar, you know? And what happens my, you know, now I, if I just read and leave, we don't have that conversation. And then what happens is that I can talk to him and his friends and talk about, you know, the importance of understanding, you know, uh, other religions. You know, it took me to Howard, come to Howard University before I had a sense of, uh, of understanding of Islam. You know, you know, I mean, I grew up with my, you know, my brother going off to the monastery, so I knew, I knew there was Trappist monks. <laughs> but you know, the other thing about the Hadith and the Quran, I didn't know that. Mm. And, and today, in 2021, you can't have that. You know. Um, and this is why when you look at what I'm writing about in terms of baseball, there are things there which are controversial, you know, uh, and definitely in the next book, you know, because I feel that this is way, okay, if, if I'm writing about baseball and it's commenting on these things, well, our society is really challenging. I, I'll read this poem, um, which is called The World Series, um, which sort of underscores what I'm saying about the, or what to write about. And, um, and one of the things about poetry, John, which you know, the emphasis is on the line. So each one of these lines is stand by itself. The World Series. One can go hitless and not understand poverty. A shutout has nothing to do with income inequality. A wild pitch might be a hurricane. An earthquake is when the bullpen collapses. Global warming is a manager pacing in a dugout. War is when players race across the field to throw punches and not pitches. Every year, the World Series is played with survivors. Now, if we were in a class, not a literature class, but say, you know, a political science class, mm -hmm. you know, one can go hitless and not understand poverty. That's a powerful line. You know, you can hand that out and say, okay, come back and write, you know, a couple of paragraphs on this, that line, okay? Yeah or an earthquake is when the bullpen collapses, okay? And so therefore, we, you know, we, we always really have a conversation about Haiti, okay? Um, so all of these questions, and then every year the World Series is played with survivors. And that's interesting because what happened? Baseball begins, you have all these teams playing, they all want to get to the World Series. World Series is played with survivors, okay? Now, you're in Afghanistan, you read this poem. You're trying to get out. <laughs> you want to try to survive. All of a sudden, yeah, this is what's happening in the World Series. We can go from Fukushima, <laughs> you could go to Haiti, you could go to the last election in Peru, you know, and, and what happened? Some of these countries are survivors, okay? They're part of the World Series. Yeah. Okay, so if you are aware, if you want to know, you know, who's in the world, yeah, there's a lot of countries that are in the World Series because they're survivors. Sure. They survive, you know, you can look up, we survived, you know, you know, the, the insurrection, <laughs> you know, you know, I mean, what happens is that this is the world we, we, we live in, you know, how many of us are going to make it? Is democracy going to make it? Yes. You know and, and these are the issues that, okay, where we're linking so you're taking that word survivors, say, which is the last word in this poem, and say, okay, what is surviving? What will survive? Okay. And that's how you, you know, when you write, you also have to say, okay, I'm writing, but how am I, how, what, what am I teaching? You know, how, how do I, if, the, if this poem is taken into a classroom, how will it be read? How will it be interpreted? Yeah. You know, now if I just want to go out and read in a cafe and have people clap and have a glass of wine, that's something else, you know, right. and I probably would write a different type of poem if that's all I was doing. Right, right. Well, l allow me to linger on, on another line you didn't mention, you didn't reread, which is the uh, uh, wild pitch being the hurricane. Right. Talk about, talk about it. Of, well, first of all, an unbelievable metaphor, but also that's, that's, a, that's an important distinction, right? When we talk about global or certainly national kind of socio-political, how many of us are one, pay, how many of our brothers and sisters are one paycheck away from climate, well, well, one ecological event away from poverty? Sure, sure. I mean, this is what you, you're looking at, what happens, and I think about this every year, you know, when you know, I grew up in New York, 
and you know, you you it's New Year's Eve, you wait for the big ball to come down, you know. And what happens? I always was thinking of like, well, who's going to be the first big name to die this year? You know, um, you know, it's not being morbid, but you know that you're going to make it. Like for example, you know, I look at what happened with COVID. Okay, uh, yeah. a lot of people I knew um, didn't make it. Okay, and so what happens, and, and I'm very much aware of that, you know, in terms of, of time and, and how much you have and, and what happens is this could be your year to go. And this is why what happened when I wrote my second memoir and used baseball as, you know, the term to, to the fifth inning, you know, I was writing the fifth inning, not just because I was turning 50, but there was a fascinating account of what was happening in, with the, our economy. You know, across the country, around 10 o'clock on a weekday, when people would come to work, you're at work, at 10 o'clock, somebody will show up. Game over. <laughs> you know, clean out your office desk and be off, you know, the premises by two. Right. You thought you were going to retire, <laughs> you know, you were going to retire, but then somebody showed up, signed this, game over. Okay. <laughs> you know, and that's very scary, you know. Um, now, now, what happens? Use another baseball situation. A lot of people wonder about, okay, COVID. Is my job going to come back? Okay, why are you thinking about that? Let's look at baseball. Look at what has happened in baseball where they eliminated a number of minor league teams. So those teams in these small cities, that was that was the economy. That's like a plant closing, you know, restaurants, things of that sort. And some people took pride in their minor league club. You know, some of the minor league fields are really nice because you can really, you know, be close to the field, close to the game. And what happens if you have a child who loves baseball, yeah, you go to a minor league game, it's a different experience. The same way, you know, if you watch the little league, if you're sitting in the grass and stuff like that, it's it's a really attractive opportunity to have a family outing, okay? But what happens is that we're at the same time that we see certain jobs coming, not coming back, certain teams and, and is, is not are not coming back. It, it means there's gonna be less players having opportunity to master baseball come through the minor leagues because there's less teams. But right. the impact on these cities is really going to be devastating. Well, sure. And 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 of course, just the 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 game itself, we can we can lament the lost game, the lost intimacy, not being able to go to games. But of course, just like seemingly everything else in a capitalist economy, who suffers first when the game shuts down? It's the vendors and the parking lot attendants and and typically, you know, those that are living paycheck to paycheck. And I, I would reckon that enough attention is never given to the real. Well, you know, that's that's why when you say that, you know, in, in my in my third book, um, you know, uh, I'm looking at baseball from that from the vendors, you know, a person carrying beer, you know, throughout throughout, you know, seven innings. Um, I, I want to capture that, and you know, one of the things I've been doing is looking at baseball from so many different angles. Okay, if you just take my two books and you just look at the table of contents, you can see that. It's very easy for me to write these baseball poems. You know, I just get a baseball concept and, and I can run with it. Okay. Um, so um, that's how it begins. Now, the, this next book, I realized I really need to tap back into the history of baseball. So, um, and I, I'll show you what I'm doing. Please. This is, this is a poem entitled Ken Griffey Sr. Okay. Even before my son turned his cap backwards, I wanted to keep him close, keep an eye on him. I didn't want to worry beyond the outfield like other fathers. I love watching my son play, the way he watched me play or when we played together. Before the love for the game, there was family. And how we loved each other was how we hit when other men were on base. There were times when his injuries made me close my eyes, but my eyes could never close after seeing the beauty of his swing or the catches made near the wall. Baseball was good to us. History will remember us because we made history. My son's Hall of Fame smile, another RBI for the record books. And that's a poem about Ken Griffey and, and a senior and Ken Griffey Jr., which is amazing, you know, to be on the same team with your dad, you know, hit home runs in the same game. But behind this, if I was to tell people what where this poem from, there are actually images in this poem that comes from my son playing basketball. You know, I love playing, you know, watching my son play basketball, you know. Um, when he was at Gonzaga, they went up to University, you know, now I'm like watching coach, which is, which is a completely different thing, you know, like, okay, right. he, you know, he doesn't have the ball in his hand, but I just love the fact that I, I learned so 
much when when he comes down to DC and we sit and watch a game. You know, this his knowledge of it is just really amazing. But what happened? I looked at that thing in terms of I love watching my son play the way he watched me play. You know, I, I, that was just looking at how um, if you grow up in an athletic family, you know, um, there's a joy. You know, I, I remember like um, um, Harper's uh, father throwing um, the balls to him during the uh, All Star, you know, batting championship, you know, uh, home run derby thing. Yeah. Um, and then you know, that's a joy, you know? And then the other thing is, um, and how we love each other was how we hit when other men were on base. There were times when his injuries made me close my eyes. I was just talking to my wife about something that happened when my son was um, um, playing in the area, you know, high school. And um, we were in the gym out in Virginia and he went up for, a, you know, I think a, either a layup or something like that. And he just got slammed down to the floor and the whole gym went silent. Okay. Now I've been in a place where we go, but this is your son out here, you know. And I remember my, my wife just, you know, grabbing my leg, you know, like you know, because like this, you're looking at this. This isn't like TV or anything like that. You're right there, and there's a certain helplessness and fear, you know. And so I looked at you know that you know how King Griffey Senior probably had to look at you know his son with so much promise being hampered by these injuries, you know. Um, so I wanted to capture that, but. I'm not just writing about the Griffey family, I'm also looking at my own family. And so what happens is that when you say, okay, how do you put a certain energy into a poem? What are you tapping into? Well, I'm tapping into some personal things and then I'm taking that into the actual writing as I'm you know, looking at Ken Griffey and researching that. But you know, this was a poem I felt I wanted to write because it, it sort of comes after, um, and I'll read this poem of um, Lost in the Sun this relationship between black fathers, and I'll read this, you know, where, you know, Ken Griffey Sr. was very fortunate as a black father to watch his son play baseball. There are other black fathers whose sons, you know, are just a statistic, lost in the sun. Joyful black fathers throwing their little ones into the air. Years later, a troubling blue sky blankets the world. Black fathers at funerals, no longer able to catch their sons. Black fathers no longer standing in a field of dreams. Their black boys gone, sunglasses unable to hide their grief. Okay, so I go from that joyful black fathers, right? And then the last word in the poem is grief. So you see that, you know, just how the, how the things change in terms of emotion changes. It starts out being joyful, but then there's this loss lost in the sun. And you know, when you when you see a player lose a ball in the sun, um, it's a very, you know, you're out there by yourself, you know, and, and what happens is that usually when that ball is lost in the sun, it's affecting the game, you know, uh, it's changed the game immediately. You know, there might've been runners on base and all of a sudden what would have been the third out, sure. and what you could already count on, you've lost it. Now, when you look at what the loss of any family member, like they'll tell you, a child should never die before his or her parents, okay? Just changes everything. Uh, and then what happens, that loss is a blinding loss, Say That son blinds you, you know? Um, it's sort of like the very much Old Testament, you know, God is taking your child because you don't love him as much. <laughs> you know, <laughs> those sort of things, you know, that sort of fire and brimstone type of thing. But to lose your son, um, and it's like where I'm talking baseball, losing the ball in the sun. Uh, so it's a play on S-U-N-S-O-N, you know. Um, and so the poem gets back to what you were saying earlier. Yeah, the poems are short, but there's so much in them that you go back. And this is what the would say. You don't read poetry the way you read a newspaper. You know, it's not, you know, it's not like a carry out, you know, put an order in and, and, and go with it. You no, know, what happened it requires you to come back to the table, <laughs> you know, uh, it's not, it's not carry out. You need to come down to the table, maybe even sample something else and read it over again. Okay. Uh, and to come away with a better taste, you a better appreciation. You know, like somebody, you know, you go back to your grandmother in the old days, you know, don't eat my food that fast. <laughs> you know, you know, <laughs> you get a stable, I know my food, but you don't want to come back. <laughs> you know, right. what happens is that, you know, that's how it, it, it works. But I try to make sure that my poems, you know, um, operate on a level where if you just appreciate poetry, 
if you appreciate maybe storytelling, you get pulled in that way. Okay. Yes. Or, or like, for example, if you're teaching poetry um, and you come across a name or like I have a poem by Jimmy Pearsall, you're going to have to look up Jimmy Pearsall. But, you know, if I'm reading, you know, Ezra Pound, so I'm going to look up a word and, you know, it might be a Chinese term or something like that I need to know. And so what happens is that even though the poem may be deceptively simple, poetry many times requires heavy lifting. That's right. Okay. And so what happens is this is why sometimes people say, oh, I don't get it. Well, well if you don't get it, take time to get it, you know. Uh, and, and this is something which I, I remember uh, I was doing a workshop up in Baltimore and there were teachers uh, in this summer workshop at, at Goucher. And what happened is uh, one teacher was talking about how she was teaching in the school in Baltimore. And she said this, she said, I gave my students, that most, she was a white professor, teacher, and she had black students. And she said, she gave them like Ezra Powell, she gave them some really difficult poetry. But somebody would say, why are you teaching this? You know, you know those movies about how the kids learn chess, <laughs> you know, but what happened? She said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm and she said to the class, this is going to be difficult. She started that out. Work with me, okay? But I guarantee if you work with me, when I put something else in front of you, you're gonna sail through it, okay? And she believed in her students. She made it say, okay, this is gonna be difficult, okay? She didn't water it down. She just said, okay, I'm gonna teach you how to read. And you know, many times what happens when we talk about trying to bring that joy of poetry to younger people, they have to be taught. They have to talk the appreciation. They, can't, they have to settle down and say, okay, this is work. Right, right. You know, but what strikes me, Ethelbert, and everything you're, you're talking about and, and, and how you're describing these poems, to, to me, what, what, you're, what you're articulating here is, is a real selfless act on the, on the artist's part. Uh, I think there's a certain art form that obliges the, the, the reader to meet them more than halfway, but you, you clearly are making an effort to, um, bring somebody in you're a good tour guide you're well, a, well yeah you're it's tour guide too guy. right but the other thing Sean as I move into this third book you'll see a lot more references you know to uh the visual arts especially the abstract expressionist you know I'm, I'm I'm into that you know where you know you say okay here's Joan Mitchell you know what you know do I understand her work do I understand Jack's book oh, yeah it requires a whole generation to say okay what's what are they doing here Okay, is they just slapping paint on a, on a canvas, you know? Can I do that? No, what happens, you're gonna have to understand exactly what this is. The same way, for example, okay, I put some Cecil Taylor on, okay? You're gonna have to understand what this is, okay? Or, or, or you know, we, you and I are in Texas, you know, Texas you know, speaks for itself, but what happened, you know, Ornette Coleman gets up, you know? And what happened, they take, beat him off the stage, you know, down there in Texas. Because what happens is that their ears weren't ready for that. That's right. You're saying your ears weren't ready for that. So what happens, you have to train those ears or your ears have to be open. Yeah. Saying now, usually what happens is that the ear is a little different from this. It gets out like Marshall McLuhan. The ear is a little different than the eye. You know, you know, what sure. happens is that the ear is much more open. Yeah. You're saying. And so what happens is that, you know, you can have a new sound. It can really change things if you are able to hear it. That's right. But I, I want to stress the point, Ethelbert, that, you know, I think there's a luxury and an indulgence, uh, even, you know, like someone like Coleman, right, or Charlie Parker, they were blazing trails that maybe they scarcely understood. They just did. They were forces of nature. But I feel like we're living. Well, well no, not go back to that. I, you know, I, you know, if you repeat that stuff, what you just said to yourself, you would say, what am I saying? <laughs> you know, what happened is that, you know, you don't want to talk to Thelonious Monk like that. Like, hey, what is he doing? <laughs> you know what he's doing? Uh -huh. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't mean they didn't know what they were doing. I meant that. But that's they, what you said. They, 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 but my point is, and, and where I was going with this is, okay. I think they, they, they couldn't, they, there was such a, an urgency. I think the kind of poetry that you're, that you're talking about, we, we don't have the luxury right now to be turning off potential engagement and discourse. So I feel like you are generously wanting to be uh, enticing and, and making it so that more people can understand and respond and ask questions. I, sure, I, but I think but I think it has a lot to do with also an audience. Who who am I who am I writing for? You know, right. uh, I mean, I now I'm very much aware 
that my work has become part of a conversation within the baseball community. Mm -hmm. And so what happens now is uh, I'm aware of that. You know, I do know, for example, you know, I'll get a review with somebody who's a real baseball fan. I can't stand these poems, right? Because, you know, what happens is like Ethelbert is like taking a knee on the third page. <laughs> you know, not, he's not singing the national anthem. So what happens is that some people come in who love baseball will sure. pick up the, the, the book and I might as well be, you know, taking a knee because what happens, they, they enjoy the game and they're going to say, okay, I go to the game. All these, this politics right in here, okay? And, um, but I'm saying, how are you going to talk about baseball without talking about Kurt Flood? <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, what happens, a lot of the politics got played out. Jackie Robinson is a political, you know, you could talk about, you know, you're a Dodger fan, but, you know, yeah. But Jackie Robinson represents a change in American politics, history, and culture, and all the other things. That's okay? right. So if you don't want to hear that, if you don't want to have all the numbers of, of baseball players on all the teams, you know, not wear 42, then, yeah, that's, then you may not want to read my book. That's right. That's right. But I, and, and, you know, I think that that's sad and that's a sad commentary on, on a lot of the, the political kind of discourse or lack thereof in our country right now. But, um, but, but look at what you're saying there. The people, whether it's, it's Kaepernick or others, you know, they have led that, die. they have forced you to deal with that. And, you know, Osaka has forced you to deal with these policies. So the type of athlete that we see today comes after the Jackie Robinson's, the Jim Brown, you know, I mean, the Kurt Flood, they're, they're, they're conscious athletes, okay? And they're not entertainers. They're also concerned about the fact, how much money are you making off me? Yes. Okay? And so what happens, all these issues are changing the game. And if you look at baseball, okay? And the, the, and the way players have been saying, okay, how can we make sure that we get more of the earnings Okay, the owners, you know, it's still a, a sort of like some sort of, you know, you know, we were joking before, you know, I know some of these owners want to keep the monuments up, <laughs> you know, because basically what happens if you break down the owners, you go back to the election, who do they vote for? They're pretty much the Donald Trump owners. I mean, especially, you know, like my man down in Dallas, you know, um, what happens is, yeah, and they represent those interests. And so what happens is that, you know, shut up and play is basically like a slaveholder mentality you know, by, from somebody to push that through Fox News. Uh, right. and, and it's dangerous because what happens is it shows you that while the game is still being played, this is what's happening. The same way I say, okay, yes. Otani, you know, everybody's celebrating, you know, this Japanese presence that came in, you know, with Suzuki and others. Yeah, but we're still targeting Asian Americans yes. in our streets. At the same time, we're celebrating somebody, you know, like comparing them to Babe Ruth, okay? Otani, what's happening to Asian Americans, um, you know, in the streets? Right. And that's what has to be addressed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, and, and I, keep in mind, and keep in mind, I say this: there was a point where there was such a stereotype of Japanese position players, Japanese position players, that Otani is like doing what you know, you know, yeah, he's changing the game. And, and look at what happens. The people are like saying, well, should he just be a pitcher or should he just be a hitter? You know, maybe he needs to make up his mind, you know, like Babe Ruth, you know, you can't do both. And I, and I laughed at that, you know, because it was, a, it was a, I mean, it might've been Barack that said this about Muhammad Ali, that, that a white person couldn't think about boxing like Muhammad Ali until so they saw Muhammad Ali. So, so my thing, why does Satani have to be Babe Ruth? <laughs> you know, he's something new, you know? I mean, you know, after a while, you know, Sunrise not gonna play certain songs. He's, you gotta have to accept him as being different, okay? And this is what happens is that these sports, we sometimes still cling to the stereotypes. When you listen to your game, Sean, listen how many times an announcer, usually white, talks about how the player has such a nice smile. And you know they never talk. don't white baseball players smile. <laughs> I, you know, the, the, I, talk to me about the white baseball player that has the best smile. Okay, and what happens? That sort of analysis is sort of like okay, he's happy. Right. Okay, he's happy. I don't care if he's from Cuba or whatever. He's basically a happy darky. Okay, and we're comfortable with that. And so all of a sudden, if you look up and the person is throwing the bat a certain way, oh, well, should, that's nothing to smile about, <laughs> you know? And so what happened, these sports players are trying to break down 
the stereotype, and even how the game is played. You see, even how the game is played. Yeah, yeah we're going to, you know, Tatis is going to throw the bat a certain way, you know, because that's how they play. And they're basically, they are changing the game. And this is where Derek Jeter is ahead of everybody. Everybody, the has to learn Spanish. I mean, Ichiro speaks Spanish. He's Japanese. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, what happens is that you, this is what happens in terms you see in baseball. Now, carry that into the other areas of our society. Should all policemen speak be bilingual? In some cities, they, maybe they should be. Yeah. So, you know, Jesus is like saying, yeah, everybody should speak Spanish in this organization. Okay? And that's just where, where it comes. Now, if you don't accept that, you probably have a problem with immigration, okay? And, and, and what happened, you want everybody to speak English. And even though that's a minority language in this hemisphere, you know, I could push Portuguese if I wanted to and back it up with some numbers with analytics, you know? I mean, what happens is that this is where you see how baseball, you know, is connected to these other changes in society. So for me to write about baseball is no different than saying, okay, what am I listening to right now politically? The rise of the right, the global warming, all these issues, I have to be in tune. If yeah. not, bring out the apples and trees and let me write about that. Yeah, and I think, you know, you, we, we are living in a time where it's, we, we, we don't have the, we don't have the, we can't afford uh, writing beautiful poems about beautiful things that are evanescent. I think it's a time that, we need to be engaging and winning hearts. Well, I disagree with you, Sean. I disagree. What happens if that, you know, we it's so important, and I go back to this, um, entitled with baseball, the love, the love of the game. You know, you don't want to get away from love. You don't want to get away from being a writer that, that gives you that sense of, of vision, that sense of hope, especially now, okay? A lot of my work, <laughs> I can bring my wife in, a lot of my work is, 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 is depressing, yeah. I address that, but there's many times, especially during Q and A, I, I will emphasize, like I'm emphasizing now, the importance of love, the importance of being hopeful, the importance of, of thinking that you can help create or usher in like the beloved community. That has to always be kept there. And what are we saying? If you don't see it, you have to work to bring it into existence. You see, that's what you have to do. And if you connect it to baseball, this is what you realize. If you got up 10 times and only got three hits, you're a really good baseball player, okay? So that means the other times you fail. If you look at how much work as an activist, you might work in terms of trying to bring about voter registration, things like that, you're gonna fail. I mean, how many civil rights workers knocked on doors and person said, oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. And they had to go to knock on another door. Yeah, yeah, they got up and maybe that, that door that they were a little tired, I'll, I'll knock on one more door. Yeah, that's your hit. Say, there's your hit. But that's the level, when you look at baseball, that's a success. You get, you, you get three hits out of the 10 times, you're in the Hall of Fame. That's right. You see? And that's just something that should be always remembered by people who are doing activism, you know, and, ground, and grassroots activism. It's going to be frustrating, okay? There's going to be opposition, but you have to keep doing it, okay, if you really want to bring about the change. I, I can't think of a better way to to I won't even say end this discussion. Let's say it's a it's a, a rain delay. Uh, <laughs> Can I end it with a poem? <laughs> uh, please. If yeah, I, 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 I'm in a poem. You know, um, I'm deeply grateful for Emily Ryder who, who wrote the introduction to my book. You know, she and she really has been such a, 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 a key person in my life in terms of explaining my work to others. The last poem in this book is actually dedicated to her, When the Gains Return. When the gains return, we will not hide behind the mask. We will race out onto the field to bask in fellowship and embrace the sky, sun, and the four bases below. There will be no fear in the air, no sickness in the stands. There will only be cheering and clapping and knowing that baseball is what matters and our dreams are round and hard and at times get caught in our gloves. When the tarp is lifted and rolled back, a sudden beauty will appear. It will be the memories of what we missed and what we love. It will be baseball. It will be prayer. And that ends the, the book. 
it ends it ends a beautiful book beautifully and uh Ethelbert, i thank you for for writing the book i thank you for being here to talk about it um and and the, the work you do as i said at the outset um you know you you can and should be celebrated and acknowledged as a as a brilliant craftsman but you're also much more than that um well, so Sean, for people who don't know i'm gonna for, for, you know this is uh, this is playing catch with you you know when i look at what you've done the last few years you know with your organization that you're building there um that's a remarkable undertaking you know it reminds me of um, people like al lefkowitz and merle lefkowitz who you know had this vision for a writer's center you know, and I remember, I remember, you know, they go have this right center in Glen Echo, you know, and, and, and I remember the poet Michael Lally said, Glen Echo, even the sound of it gives me the bends, you know, but what happened, Al Lefkowitz, Merle Lefkowitz and others had this vision and it went from Glen Echo to where it is now Bethesda and what you're doing, you know, it starts out that way, you know, but it has to be people like yourself that have the time, um, the, you know, and you're writing. Say so. What happens is that you're wearing more than one hat. You know, you introduce me wearing one, you know one hat. But you know, I, I respect and admire you, and I and I sort of keep tabs on what you're doing. <laughs> you know, because you're definitely making a, a contribution to to at least um, you know American literature at this particular time. Well, I appreciate that, Ethelbert, and you know, uh, standing on the shoulders of giants for sure. But you to make, making you take note and be proud is is a is a genuine inspiration and source of. Uh, motivation yeah. but um let let let's say that uh you know you you are always welcome anytime maybe we'll can throw together a special reading right around the world series sure. and we can really celebrate maybe take mm -hmm. an even deeper dive into some of these but um you know for the time we have what an honor and and, and a genuine joy to talk with you and, and learn from you oh well, thank you very much so folks uh i'm going to put this all over the 1455 site Ethelbert's new collection, When Your Wife Has Tommy John Surgery. Check it up, check it out. Uh, you may surprise yourself how much you remember that you love the game or need to love the game and uh, love each other. So until next time, my friend, uh, thank okay. you so much. All right, and thank you to the Potter's House. Always, and yeah, we'll, we'll, put, we'll put links there. And, and when you pick up your copies, patronize and support independent bookstores because that's what we're all about here, so. Mm. Okay. Uh, have a safe, good weekend, and we'll all talk soon. Okay, many blessings. Okay, cheers. All right.